Okay, first off, I'm going to ask you guys to think of what pops into your head when you think Woodstock. Just have that going in your head right now. Okay, so maybe it is... Maybe it's hippies, maybe it's drugs, which were definitely present. Maybe it's just a concert festival vibe. Maybe if you're like my dad, it's a little bird from Snoopy. <clears throat> but in this speech, I'm gonna be explaining like why those things do pop into your head, and then I'm gonna tell you the history about Woodstock. So <clears throat> I chose Woodstock. Um, because it's formally named the Woodstock Music and Arts Fair. I chose it because uh, it's got a lot of history behind it. The effects of Woodstock still stand with us today. Um, I thought it would be important for us to know because, I mean, these kids that went to this were our age or around that age, so I thought it would be interesting to be able to put ourselves in their shoes and go from there. Um, so first we're gonna start off with how Woodstock came to be and where it was held, the creation of it. Then we're going to talk about the event, the people involved, what went on, and then we'll move on to its legacy and how it still affects us today. So the planning started with four men. These two, John Roberts and Joel Rosenman, seen here, were the ones that funded the project, kind of the original creators of the idea. Um, and they got with a man named Artie Cornfield, who was a record executive that could help them get shows and um, bands and people to perform. And then they met with Michael Lang, um, he was an event promoter and a uh, successful one that they knew could get the word out and get a lot of people at Woodstock. Um, these four men weren't really involved with the hippie culture, but they knew that it was up and coming and they knew it was important and they knew that they could get um, this young crowd involved, they knew they could draw them in. Uh, <clears throat> they formed a group called Woodstock Ventures. They named it after the town in New York, Woodstock, which is um, was the home of Bob Dylan, that's why they picked this venue, and they hoped that they'd be able to do it there. Unfortunately, they couldn't. They were turned down by several towns that knew what the um, event would bring and <laughs> all the problems that it would cause. Um, one town turned them down 31 days before the event was set. They had already done all their planning and they had to figure something completely different out. Um, <laughs> but a man named, excuse me, a man named Max Yasger, opened up uh, his 600 uh, acre field, his land, to host the event and just said, how about it? It was in Bethel, New York. Um, and the people of Bethel, New York did not approve. This is the largest group of people ever assembled in one place. The important thing that you've proven to the world is that a half a million kids, and I call you kids because I have children that are older than you are, a half a million young people can get together and have three days of fun and music and have nothing but fun and music, and I got pleasure for it. The man. Okay, so the man we just saw speaking was Max Yasker, the farm uh, owner that opened up his land. Uh, he just really wanted to be a part of the movement and wanted to have um, uh, an, a spot in it, and he did just that. So, <clears throat> the date was set, they had, oh, presenter view would be good. To the right. To the right? Uh, no. All right. <laughs> the one with the... Hey, okay, okay, okay. So the date was set. We were ready to go. They set it for the dates August 15th through 17th, but because of events that I will explain in a minute, um, the dates changed a little bit. Oh, no. I lost my...
Okay, so transitioning into the event itself. Um, there were large, large numbers clogging roadways um, <clears throat> several days prior to the event. <clears throat> it got so crazy and so packed that um, acts had to be uh, taken in by helicopters because their tour buses could not get through the roads. Uh, so, they sold 100,000 tickets originally, but in all the process, the fame, it just blew up, uh, and nearly half a million people were in attendance. Um, fences had to be broken down because it couldn't contain everyone, and event promoters just decided to heck with it, you don't have to pay, we're not taking tickets anymore, because they thought it would be too much of an issue, cause too many riots to, um, make sure everyone had a ticket and it was easier to just let people have at it. Um, although this did cause some issues, uh, the, there wasn't enough room for everyone. The people in attendance were not very well liked. Um, in a CBS broadcast, April 14th, uh, or April 18th of 1969, it is easy to tell that the broadcasters did not approve of these people that were attending. They did not like them at all. Um, and many people didn't. This uh, hippie culture wasn't like these were people that were protesting the wars. They were rebellious, and this whole event became controversial because of it. Um, large numbers caused this, all these problems and the rain of the weekend. Um, they had food shortages because of the unexpected numbers. Uh, because of that, there was unavailab unavailability of restroom, restroom facilities, which the food shortages kind of helped. Um, and the town had nothing to do with it. They didn't want to provide any police assistance. So drugs obviously had a major, major presence with this hippie culture. Um, LSD, pot, weed, marijuana, whatever you want to call it, were present. Um, acid was an issue. Um, they did this for the psychedelic feeling and the upbringing and all of that that they got. Um, in an article entitled Drugs and Morals by psychology professor Timothy Leary, um, he claimed that there was like almost a dozen things called freakout tents where these people who were overdosing could go during the day and be treated and then get back to the concert that night. Um, fans didn't really care, mainly because they were high. They didn't, they didn't matter what was going on. They just rolled with the punches. They didn't care if there wasn't enough food, if they didn't really have a place to sleep. Um, they weren't concerned with anything. Um, this is a quote from the New York Times article in 2009. Uh, this is from Lou Yang. He was a police chief in a nearby town at the time. Notwithstanding their personality, their dress, and their ideas, they were and they are the most courteous, considerate, and well-behaved group of kids I have ever worked with and been in contact with of my 24 years of police work. So even though these numbers were so large and these weren't the most upstanding citizens at the uh, concert, they didn't cause too many problems. Um, they came for the concert. The lineup included bands like Can He, Grateful Dead, Mountain, Janis Joplin, Janis Joplin, Santana, The Who, um, one of the most famous, Jimi Hendrix, and then there were just so many more. It was constant concerts and constant um, shows going on. Um, in an article written in the New York Times, August 17th of 2011, this quote from uh, Woodstock, an article previously written during the Woodstock Times was included, Waves of weary youngsters steamed away from the Woodstock Music Fit and Art Fair last night and early today. Security officials reported at least two deaths, 4,000 people treated for injuries, illness, and adverse drug reactions over the festival's three-day period. As well as this, um, it said that there were two births. <laughs> um, though some of those bands I just mentioned you may not know, they have a huge impact in music culture today, um, which is my next point, how uh, Woodstock affected music today. Um, pop music stems from blues and rock, and then the R&B that was featured at Woodstock uh, is similar to R&B that we still listen to today. Um, many famous artists credit their work to performers of the time, like Jimi Hendrix. Um, John Mayer said in a 2004 interview with Rolling Stone, "When I listen to Hendrix, I just hear a man, and it's most, and that's what's most beautiful. When you remember another human being was capable of what he ad achieved." <clears throat> who, who I am as a guitarist is defined by my failure to become Jimi Hendrix. However far you stop on your climb to become like him, that's who you are. So he's saying he gives all credit to his work to trying to strive to be like Jimi Hendrix, and he's essentially saying that everyone should try to be like Jimi Hendrix. 
hundreds. Um, on the far right over there, you have uh, Post Malone, who's an artist who also credits his work to um, Jimi Hendrix. And another way it is seen as similar to today, you have a lot of festivals and concert that, concerts that resemble Woodstock. This Coachella Festival just finished this past weekend, and it's huge, uh, much like Woodstock was, featuring our very popular artists, just like Woodstock did. Um, in conclusion, I hope that you have learned about the history and everything that Woodstock holds and why it is important in the creation of our country. Um, and I hope that you see what it has done for our world today. Um, we went through how it began, what happened while uh, it, the event, what happened while the event itself was going on and who attended, and then um, what it does to our world today. And I hope that you've learned enough about it through this that maybe you'll even be urged to go to a concert or a festival right now and it just might change your life as many people uh, say Woodstock changed theirs. Thank you.